is all of this. We lose this much because of no georeferencing, and we're left only with these. I think that's all that's in there. Yeah. Okay, so that's a pretty scary picture, but it's also a pretty optimistic picture, which is to say, if I just go in and georeference the textual descriptions of the localities, I can double the amount of digital accessible knowledge like that. Wow. That's a step forward. And if I were to spend some time on those names, I might be able to increase it even more. Or I might push those records over to Peru or over to Tanzania or whatever. Okay? I don't really know whether those are Kenyan records or not. And then this chunk of the pie, the non-standard names, probably I, as an ornithologist, could sit down and work through most of them. It's not an easy task. I have a, another project, which is probably going to be the death of me, um, which is to do this sort of analysis, a gap analysis, for all digitally accessible data on the birds of the world. And I started this project about three years ago. It's with a couple people at GBIF. Um, started into the analyses and realized that I had 12,000 non-standard names. About 85% of the birds of the world were represented in the digital accessible knowledge but I had 12,000 non-standard names. So I had reason to stay at home for two months. And I sat there for two months, and I used my best knowledge as an ornithologist, and I used the internet, and I used some paper sources, and I fixed almost all of those. It was a hellish amount of work. And so finally, we got some other things fixed, and I decided, okay, now I just want to catch up. That was 2010. So for 2013, all I need to do is clean up the new non-standard names that have entered into the data set. And I've already cleaned up 12,000 of them. So it should be easy. Guess how many non-standard names accumulated between 2010 and 2013? 12,000, which is to say, Chris, can I stay home for two months? <laughs> so how do we do this? How do we, how do we fill these gaps? The easiest way is to plug those leaks. Check and fix the taxonomy. Quality control and error check the data and georeference the data that don't have a quantitative georeference. I'd actually take that one step farther. GBIF really just focuses on is there a latitude longitude? But there's a whole protocol out there as far as how you add robust georeferences to data, taking into account the precision of the data point, right? You could have two sites in South Africa both referring to the same point. And one might be a place where somebody went out, collected an organism, and held a GPS unit and clicked. So you have an error radius the size of this room, basically, 10 meters, 20 meters. The other site that falls in exactly the same place might just be a record that says collected in South Africa. And so the centroid of South Africa might be that point. And so, you know, what's, what's the radius of South Africa, right? So unless you have essentially quality information on the georeference, which I'm betting most of those data that were georeferenced, those 24,000 records, I'm betting most of them don't have that information. 
because the only systematic efforts to add those georeferences have been through VertNet. There are a bunch of other groups that are starting. I know Sanbi's had some training from the VertNet people, from John Wachorek. Um, but basically, if you don't have that information, you probably shouldn't be doing things like running niche models and things like that. Those are the, the leaks. A second level is find the existing digital data and get them shared. Some museum that has digital data, some observational effort that has digital data, but is not making them available through GBIF portal and others. So, um, National Museums of Kenya just finished capturing its bird collection database. To my knowledge, that data set's not online. It should be. Um, third, find existing analog data, non-digital data, and prioritize that information for capture and sharing. I'll pick on the British Museum again. Kenya was a British colony, clearly, clearly. The British Museum has thousands of Kenyan birds and yet nothing is digital and certainly nothing's online. There you go. And fourth, I'm not saying you leave the field work until, you've af until after you've done all this, but fourth, certainly is the de novo field work. Ideally, not always possible, but ideally, you do the field work at the sites that have never been sampled before. The real gaps. All I showed you in this talk is the gaps in digital accessible knowledge. But ideally, we do it in the gaps in knowledge. Now, there may be reasons to go back to sites. For example, there may be no frozen tissue to permit molecular analyses. Or maybe we want to look at final change. And so maybe we go back to the best sampled sites, where somebody worked in 1890 and brought back 5,000 specimens, documents the avifauna really thoroughly, and we can go in and document the avifauna really thoroughly, and then we can ask what's changed. Okay? This is yours, Chris? Yes. Uh, I, I think, I think the, uh, One second. This, this can be really cheap to actually get new data if you can use citizen scientists to get it. And um, yeah, the big advantage, of course, is that you're getting 21st century data, not some data from 100 years ago. So, Les, you, you and I probably see that last clause a bit differently. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I see that old data as in some sense, benchmarking everything for change. I'm absolutely in agreement with you that we could probably get a quarter million new records from Kenya like that via citizen scientists, and that's extremely valuable data. I'm right with you on that. It may not do much, yeah, let's use this map to fill these gaps, given political situations up here, okay, which is to say your citizen scientists go to the places where they can go. You know, Jean was asking yesterday, what do we do about the eastern third of, of, of the DRC? Well, your citizen scientists aren't going in there. But I'm right with you. I mean, definitely, definitely. There's a, there's a balance. Yeah, we need to go hand in hand. I wouldn't put it in, in fourth place. In, no, I, I, as I said when I, when I presented that, it doesn't have to go in fourth place. Um, 
but ideally we do this with best knowledge of where the gaps are. Okay, I think you'll accept that from me, right? Okay. Um, but to me the real interesting message is what we can actually use in analysis is a tiny proportion of the number of records that we wave over our data sets and say, look, I've got 400 million records. And yet, of those 400 million records, I can tell you that a quarter million are from one bird species, northern cardinal, that occurs right outside my house. Okay? In fact, there's a cardinal that sings every morning in the spring a meter from my bed and wakes me up at 5 a.m. One of these days, one of these days that bird's going to end up in the collection. Okay? <laughs> but all I'm after is that those numbers are deceptive, one, because the data that are actually fit for use are many, 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 many times fewer. And the other thing is, if you invest seriously in fitness for use, remember that pie diagram I showed you, I think it's just before this, you can go from this to a much bigger piece of the pie. It takes investment in fitness for use. And that is something that GBIF has not done. If I were directing GBIF, I would say that GBIF is the ideal forum for taking on this challenge. Ideal. Why? Because, looking at whom to point, Jean is from Benin and probably could do it himself or find somebody to do it, where all of the Beninese records in GBIF get georeferenced via ideal protocols. And then you could go, whatever the, the pie chunks are in Benin, you could go from this to this. Boom. <coughs> so that's something that GBIF could promote given its world stature. Give, how many countries was it? 40 some, 50 some? In Chibif? Yeah. It's over 100. Okay. So if we have 100 countries, imagine if each one of them were encouraged to and training were provided to help them just with georeferencing. In Kenya, you double the amount of information you have. GBIF could also promote taking on these challenges. What that means is you interface with the taxonomic specialists. Okay? You interface with the people who can look at a non-standard name and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, there were a couple people who used that spelling. It's really this. Yeah. I can do that in Mexico. I can't do that in Kenya. In Kenya, I actually have to work, right? <laughs> So the point is, one, the numbers are deceiving, and two, you can fix them pretty easily. You can fix most of them pretty easily. So, back to you, Chris. Hold on. Yeah. I'm sorry? Question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can do questions. Hold on one second for Kate. Can you walk over near Jim? I see your, your, presentation, your presentation, and especially on gap analysis, is very relevant. And what you have said should be what we will be doing in coming year in GB. You are uh, with uh, Chris, uh, and he's the world of the me as well. And uh, actually, uh, let's say what we can achieve is that in each node, at each node level, we can do such gap analysis and then fill, fill the data, fill the gaps where, uh, let's say, it appears. That will be, and 
my, my question is that can you assist GBIF to enable such uh, capacity building at the low limits of uh, the country? Certainly. Um, GBIF has been getting this advice for a decade. Um, I, I headed the Forward Look Committee a few years ago, and, and these ideas, not that analysis, but these ideas were in all of that. Uh, building the capacity, actually next week's course has one whole day on survey gap analysis, which is exactly this. Um, and we'll have a few of the same participants and many more um, from more countries. Um, and all of that, those training materials will be online. But uh, my personal energy, certainly. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm hopefully this year wrapping up that global view. And the fun thing for that global view is that we've developed uh, fairly fine-grained metrics of inventory completeness, like what I showed you from Brazil. And that is for every 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer pixel on the face of the Earth. And so what we're polishing up right now, we've got the basic view, we know where the gaps are, but we're, what we're polishing up right now is how those gaps are closing with more and more digital accessible knowledge. So I think our earliest version of the GBIF data set is 2008. And so we can track 2008 up to 2013 and see whether, is it just that the numbers are rising and it's more and more cardinals and things like that outside of my house in the data set? Or is it that those gaps are closing? A really nice example of closing gaps is Australia. The data set that we used for most of the analyses for the World Bird Project is from 2010. And Australia was almost empty. Literally, you saw kind of the, the eastern and southern coast with some knowledge and nothing else. And the Atlas of Living Australia comes online. And Australia, not 100%, but 80%, boom, it's well known. So there's a gap that got filled because the country of Australia plugged a big leak, right? The question is, if we point out those gaps, so like northern and eastern Kenya, if we point out those gaps, unless ideally working hand in hand with the citizen scientists, if we point out those gaps and say, hey, you know, we're really needing information from this state or this region or this biome, can we take that global or regional or national rate of accumulation of knowledge of the avifauna, can we take that baseline rate and make it go up really quickly. So it's essentially filling those gaps strategically. Not just playing for numbers, but rather playing for importance of data, relevancy of data. That's, that's what I really want to do. And that whole body of work will be wrapped up, I hope, by the end of the year, if Chris gives me two months off. You can have the whole year off. <laughs>